Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. Let's thank some sponsors who make the show possible. No Good Deed, book one of the Mark Taylor psychological thriller series by M.P. McDonald, is free on Amazon.com. Seeing the future comes at a price. What price would you be willing to pay to save thousands of lives? Mark Taylor knows his actions scream guilty, but he was only trying to stop the horrible terrorist attack. Instead of a thank you, the government labels him an enemy combatant and throws him in the brig with no rights, no trial, and no way to prove his innocence. He learns firsthand that the CIA can do anything they want to him, anything at all. Mark's just a regular guy, a photographer, who finds himself in an extraordinary situation when an antique camera he buys at a dusty Afghanistan bazaar produces photographs of future tragedies, tragedies he's driven to prevent. His frantic warnings about September 11th are ignored, but put him in the government crosshairs when he learns what being labeled an enemy combatant really means. Download this intense and gripping thriller now, free on Amazon. No Good Deed, book one of the Mark Taylor psychological thriller series by M.P. McDonald. As the Crow Flies, Enter Haddon Wood, book one by Risa Walker and Caleb Ansel. From Risa Walker, the award-winning author of the best-selling Kronos Files, and debut author Caleb Amsel comes a chilling story of altered reality and psychological terror. Chase Ray sits perfectly still, his thumbs traveling across the screen of the broken computer tablet, stuck in the nexus between two worlds. Haddon Wood isn't real. It can't be. Another world, another reality, hovers just beyond his reach. He can see it sometimes. He can almost touch it. In that world, things are in balance. The dead stay dead and the creature feature remains safely on the screen. That world isn't a patchwork quilt of every scary book or movie he's seen. In that world, the nightmares generally end when you open your eyes and people don't glitch in and out of existence. Chase is determined to return to that world, although he's a bit worried that the only way out is through the noose that seems to lurk around every corner. He needs allies to get back home. But how do you choose your team when you can't tell who's real? As the Crow Flies, Enter Haddon Wood, Book One by Risa Walker and Caleb Amsel. We're so happy to have our friend Crystal Pico Watanabe as a sponsor of the show. Crystal is one of the best editors in the business, and she has just debuted a new service that I think you'll absolutely love and will help you to up your writing game. Pico's School of Wordcraft and Editing has just debuted, and the first course is called Properly Punctuating Dialogue. It's a mini course and can be completed in just about 20 minutes. It covers the basics of dialogue punctuation. Authors can get access to the new school and the course for free by signing up for Crystal's author newsletter, Notes from Pico. Go to picoshouse.com slash newsletters. That's P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E dot com slash newsletters. More in-depth courses will be added in 2020. Make sure you don't miss a thing. picoshouse.com slash newsletters. Unwilling Souls by Gregory D. Little. Books 1 and 2 are only 99 cents for a limited time. The gods are rightfully imprisoned, and Cess intends to keep them that way. But her terrorist father has other plans. Gregory D. Little's Unwilling Souls is a pulse-pounding chase through an epic fantasy world of adventure, sinister conspiracy, and a magical industrial revolution fueled by harvested human souls. Cess is the daughter of powerful parents who would very much like to kill one another and who therefore pretend she doesn't exist. An apprentice jailer of the gods, Cess spends her days learning to forge the tools needed to maintain the gods' prison. When her terrorist father attacks the prison on her 16th birthday, 
Cess is forced to flee after the secret of her parentage is revealed. Suddenly on the wrong side of the law, Cess realizes the very father who abandoned her may be the only one who can protect her. But some secrets are darker than parentage. On her way to find her father, Cess will uncover truths about her family and herself that will shatter her understanding of the world and risk the return of the gods themselves. Unwilling Souls and its sequel, Ungrateful God, are on sale now for only 99 cents. The third book of the series is coming early next year, so now is the perfect time to get up to speed. Unwilling Souls by Gregory D. Little. Books 1 and 2, only 99 cents for a limited time. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Lindsay McRae on the show with me today. Uh, Lindsay has a fantastic new book. It's called My Penguin Life, Life Among the Emperors. And uh, let me tell you guys, this book is is astounding. Um, what an incredible story. And uh, I'm so excited to talk with you uh, today. Welcome to the show, Lindsay. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you. Uh, we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Um, oh, blimey. Um, I think probably watching A Family of Badgers, which is how my career started, um, and wanting to tell people about what I'd seen. Um, so, yeah, I think, that was, I think that was my first memory of, of that. Wow. Um, how old would you have been then? Uh, probably nine or ten. Um, yeah, I just remember seeing wh- whatever I saw in front of me was so amazing. I was desperate to tell people about it. What um, what sort of impact did that have on you? Um, uh, did that open your eyes to a whole new you know aspect of of life and the world? What what was it that uh, that excited you the most? Um. I don't know, really. I mean, I was so young and I've had this passion for so long now. Um, I just loved spending every minute of every day outside. I was really and still am, you know, so into the natural world. And um, it's my um, get out of jail card, if you like, if I'm <laughs> having a rough time at home or, or, you know, in the city, just getting outside and, and getting amongst the natural world is my switch off button. Um, and I see such amazing stuff that um, yeah, I want to tell people about it. You've, uh, you've worked as a, a wildlife photographer, uh, and cameraman for, uh, quite some time. How, how did you start steering in that direction, uh, career wise? Um, well, I always wanted to work with wildlife. Um, it wasn't until I was sort of my early teens that I got any experience with a camera. And um, I wrote to the BBC wanting them to come and film in my area. Um, and they actually came and made a small film about me because this was probably 16, 17 years ago now. Um, and for a young boy at, um, uh, that long ago, it was kind of a funky thing to do. None of my mates were into bird watching or watching wildlife. So it's quite unusual. Um, so, yeah, the BBC made the small film. They lent me a small camera and I very quickly realized the opportunities this piece of kit gave me. Um, and then I, I realized that maybe I could work with wildlife and cameras and, and film it for a living. And you never ever think that that you're going to reach, you know, that's actually going to become your career or I certainly never did. But fortunately I left school. I'd made a few contacts um, and the BBC offered me a job and all I was doing was making cups of tea and doing the shopping, but it was meeting more people. Um, and yeah, that was the way I, that's the way I got in really. Well, making cups of tea in the place where stuff happens um, yeah, sometimes it is just that that's all a kid needs, you know, to, to be, to be near where stuff happens, uh, can be contagious. Yeah. That first, that first foot in the door is usually the hardest, but once you've, once you've conquered that step, um, yeah, things happen quickly. And certainly that was the case with me. Right. Well, some people bird watch or take wildlife photography, um, as a hobby and it's just for their personal satisfaction for their uh, you know, personal enlightenment, uh, but it's another thing to seek out things that you then want to share with the world. Um, what is, what is it about the, the education aspect of it, the enlightenment aspect, 
um, that that makes you want to take what you see and bring more people into your world? Well, I was lucky because I've I've grown up knowing how amazing our natural world is and how how important it is. Um, and a lot of youngsters lose that very early on. And why I'm not quite sure whether um, adults just don't quite drill it into them and, and that's how they lose it. But um, yeah, I'm I'm just fully aware of how important, how how good it is for for mental health as well. If you know, if, if I'm stressed, it's where I go and it's where I'm easily just back down to earth. And um, I think it's important that people know that and um, and are aware of how easy it is just to. Um, to, to to get the headspace and, and think and um you know it doesn't have to be life doesn't have to be 100 mile an hour all the time um and yeah I, I just think the more the more i can tell people about how amazing the, the natural world is then maybe you know the, the the ones who aren't so interested give it a go and and realize how how cool it is so you go from making tea and running errands uh at the bbc how does how does that transition into more of what you were seeking um well it, it was it was being in touch with the right people and being around them and, and and managing to show them that i meant business and i knew what i was on about and i was keen um the program i was actually working on i my working hours would be from 8 a.m until about 10 p.m it would they were long days so the only spare time i had was before 8 a.m but obviously that's a a great time for wildlife so i'd go in early and um and go walk about and, and find stuff. And then I'd ring the producers or the cameramen. Hey, cool. Look, look what I found. Come and film it. So very quickly I was, I was contributing more than I think they were expecting. Um, so yeah. So after, after that, I was given camera assisting roles uh, where I could get my hands on actual camera equipment. Um, and I always knew, knew the ins and outs of the wildlife. That's how I got to where I am. Really. I didn't really know the ins and outs of camera kit. So being able to get my hands on professional gear um, was all I really needed. Um, and yeah, it was it was these people that I'd met through making cups of tea for them that gave me these opportunities. Um, your your book, My Penguin Year, uh, Life Among the Emperors, is is this grand adventure that you went on for the better part of a year uh, studying the the emperor penguins in Antarctica, of all places. Um you probably don't go from uh, just a, a you know a work a day uh, visual journalist to an epic adventure like that. Um, how did you start venturing out uh, to more and more adventurous uh, subjects that eventually led to this? Um, yeah, well, I um, it's funny. Very quickly, um, work starts coming to me that was abroad um, and. I'd be camera assisting and then I was given opportunities. And, and by the time I was offered Antarctica, I had actually been filming wildlife uh, for the BBC and other independent companies for eight years. So a decent amount of time. So a lot of people knew me at this point. Um, and I think, I think for a lot of wildlife camera people going to Antarctica and filming emperors is top of their list. Um, and certainly had been top of mind for as long as I can remember, but you never expect it to be offered. These trips are few and far between. And when they do come, um you you don't expect them to come to you you expect somebody else to get asked um so yeah so when i was uh when i was given this opportunity it was simply one i just couldn't turn down what uh what was your first experience with uh with the emperor penguins how did how did this uh, you, you talk about this kind of being the pinnacle of what what people aspire to um how did you learn about them and what really piqued your interest um well bizarrely enough it was all the the sort of bad aspects of the trip trip that excited me so i'd be as the furthest away from home i probably ever could be um i'd be working in the hardest conditions uh, i'd ever experience but um i the payoff would be filming a creature which so few people get to see everybody knows what an emperor penguin looks like um their life cycle is relatively well known but but actually seeing one in the wild, uh, so few people get even tourists. Um, so few tourists get the opportunity to actually um, see them. So I just knew this was such a rare 
opportunity. Uh, in fact, you could probably count on two hands the amount of people that have spent an entire year just watching Emperors. That was the 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 aim of their year. Um, yeah, so I, I I I know how lucky I've been. When when you decided to take on this project, uh, this meant uh, not only you know being away from from work for a year, but this uh, this was a big decision for your personal life as well. You were newly married. Um, tell me about uh, how how did this opportunity come about, and what were some of the the personal stakes that you had in it? Yeah, well, I was although it was a, a dream of mine. I didn't really know what what it involved um, and what sacrifices I'd have to make. I was, I suppose I was a bit naive in that respect, but yeah, at that point I, I had a girlfriend who had two dogs. We had, we'd bought a house um, and I'd actually met Becky, my wife. We, we got married just before I left, but we'd met in television and um, she remembers vividly. One of the first things I ever said to her, she asked me, what, what do you most want to film? And, and I said, well, Emperor's in Antarctica. So she knew deep down that she couldn't stop me from going. And um, But still, I remember that I actually knew two years in advance of going that I was going. There was a lot of preparation involved. Um, so there was a long lead up time. And the, the couple of months before I actually left, I had huge second thoughts. I really thought mentally I didn't think I could cope. I thought um, th there was a long period throughout my 11 month trip where I wouldn't be able to get home. And that's one of the reasons it was so long is um, there's a period of isolation where the weather just prevents anybody from coming in and anybody from leaving. Um, and I did think maybe I'm not actually uh, ready for this. It's uh, it's quite a big undertaking. And I almost threw the towel in. But fortunately, I went ahead with it. And um, but yeah, it, it, yeah. And, and it's what is quite good about this book is been, I've been able to um, talk about sacrifices which people don't necessarily no they watched the final program and they'd see a little bit about how it was made but obviously i've got family at home that make enormous sacrifices too so um yeah it was nice to go behind the scenes when uh so you said that there's like a two-year preparation time of all of the 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 things to to get in line to make a trip like this um what was the what was the plan the the work plan if you will um you know did you did you have a schedule of when we land, this is going to happen? Uh, what were some of the the accomplishments that you that you had laid out that you wanted to make sure happened while you were there? Well, yeah, well, filming wise, so for the actual film, um, basically we wanted to cover every aspect of the Emperor Penguin's life cycle, and that that is quite well known. It's it's a story that's been told many times, so we wanted to try and do it differently. Um, so yeah, so we had. Um, the, the emperors returning after their summer at sea feeding that was on our list we obviously had mating laying their eggs eggs hatching um, all the the classic stuff which goes into reproducing that next generation um, but this series was different because it was focusing on that one individual family or group and what we were relying on were things happening while we were there to bring our film to life and um and yeah, we managed to capture some pretty unusual events that, that ended up being key parts of the film. And, and that's what made it at the end of the day. But that was purely because we were given such a huge amount of time to focus on uh, on the colony and, and capture these bits of behavior that we didn't expect. How do you prepare for a trip like that? You're, you're um, living and, and working in England um, and, you know, this is a this is a part of the world that very few of us will ever get to visit, much less spend a prolonged amount of time. Um, and there's there's really no dress rehearsal for that um, without being there. You know, that's it's one of those things that it's, it's very difficult to duplicate for any amount of time. Uh, how do yeah. you prepare for the conditions and for, you know, how you're going to adapt to day to day life in such a harsh climate? Yeah, well, we um, well pre preparing to be in a harsh climate. There was nothing we could do really, other than wait and see what it was like. But we being being isolated put a whole new spin on things because we wouldn't be able to get help if we needed it. We were relying on each other, our team members. Um, but that meant being completely self sufficient. A lot of us. So we did um, we did a lot of training up on a glacier in Austria, in the middle of Europe. 
um, where there are bigger, big crevasses in the ice and we learned how to pull ourselves out and rescue our teammates in case that happened. Um, we actually did a, an intense firefighter training course, believe it or not, because if the station we were living in set alight, we would be the ones that would have to put that fire out. So we had to learn how to do that. Um, and obviously medically, um, I was examined so thoroughly because they didn't want to be sending down somebody who would then maybe get ill and um, they'd have to evacuate me because evacuation was possible, but um, it's it's easier to rescue somebody from the International Space Station that is in, that is in an Antarctic winter. So we just had to accept that that was pretty impossible. So they obviously wanted to make sure that we were fit and healthy enough to, to travel in the first place. Um, and kit wise, yeah, we, we actually put cameras into a freezer room in, in the south of the UK and dropped the temperature to minus 40 and made sure that they worked. But yeah, nothing could really prepare us until we actually got down there and got to work. So um, yeah, it's funny, a lot of people ask me, oh, what's it going to be like? And uh, I just had to answer, I've no idea. I'll tell you when I get back. Oh, man. Um, what, how much footage did you shoot while you were there? Um, well, time wise, I, I probably can't tell you, I don't know, but, um, s size wise. So the unusual thing about this trip was back when planet earth, the first BBC series had gone down there and overwintered, um, everything was shot on film. So not only could they not review it, um, they had to wait until they got back to the UK before it was developed, before they could even see if their cameras had actually worked. Whereas when we went down, we had, uh, there's been such a, an advance in technology with regards to camera kit and, and uh, the station had good internet. So we were able to review clips, offload them, put them on hard drives and actually send low resolution footage back to our producers in the UK to, for them to review. Um, so size wise, I think we took about 120 terabytes worth of wow. storage. Um, we didn't fill that. I'm not sure how how close we got, but um, yeah, it, it was it was pretty mega. Yeah. Um, what was uh, when you landed, and you know, kind of the the reality of you know the adventure that we're on, and and the the commitment that we've made. Um, what was that emotionally like? Uh, you know, once you're there, and you kind of cross the point of no return. Um, you know, do, does the 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 anticipation of this thing that you've looked forward to is that enough to carry you through um you know wh what do you do when things get lonely and and stark yeah well i i found the whole thing quite emotional just um not not because i was struggling with being away from home i mean i was at certain points but um just the enormity of what i was witnessing i, I just knew how special everything was that we were seeing uh, I remember when we first landed and I'd actually had a tough week because I'd left home. I'd left Becky, my wife, on the doorstep in tears. And we knew that we wouldn't see each other for the next year. Um, and all I wanted to do was get there and get on with the job and, and get busy. And um, we'd had a week in Cape Town waiting for the weather in Antarctica to settle before we could actually fly. Um, and that week was quite a long week, just waiting for that plane to, to come and pick us up. But once we landed... Um, and we saw our first penguins. It was it was game on. Um, and um, from then on, that, that was really when the adventure started. And yeah, from then on, we were just seeing amazing stuff every day. So um, when you land, how long does it take you to catch up with the uh, the, the group of penguins? And, um, you know, what did they think of you being there? Well, we. We turned up on the longest day in the Southern Hemisphere, the 21st of December, just before Christmas. Um, and what we expected to land to was um, uh, Atka Bay, which is where our penguins breed on the on the sea ice, on the frozen ocean. The previous years, before we'd gone down there, this sea ice had remained solid, even throughout the summer. It hadn't broken up. So the penguins had always been there. They'd been coming and going from the ocean, feeding. Um, anyway, when we turn up, that that whole bay broke up and it was all open ocean all of a sudden and the penguins went with it so we saw a few penguins to start with but it was a case then of waiting for the sea to refreeze for that that solid platform which they would breed on to reform and then they would return having fed for the summer so it was um it was a strange week to start with because we had all these penguins to film and then all of a sudden we had nothing and it was a case of waiting well three or four months really for the the sea to refreeze and um 
yeah, it was that was a bit of a shock and something we weren't expecting, but um, it made it made the day that they did return even more special. Oh sure, that that had to be disheartening at least in the in in the beginning. You know, we 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 did all this to come, and now you know it's it's sit and wait. Uh, what yeah, what did absolutely. you do to occupy your time? Yeah, it was very frustrating as well, and I was questioning why have we come to this place? You know, the penguins have gone, I've got nothing to film, and um, however. Um, having said that, the wildlife which an open ocean um, offered was incredible. So we were seeing orcas, killer whales every day. We were seeing minke whales every day. And these are um, whales that wouldn't have been able to feed in this part of Antarctica because they wouldn't have been able to breathe with a layer of ice that thick. So with this ice breaking up, it opened up all these new opportunities. Um, we were seeing snow petrels, Antarctic petrels, giant petrels, um, Weddell seals, leopard seals. It was just fantastic. And only because um, the sea ice had broken up. So um, although the penguins had gone and we did see the odd penguin drift by on an ice flow. But um, but yeah, how, with it with it breaking up, it did have its advantages. What, what do you think the penguins thought of you and your small crew that were there? Did uh, Were they... Uh, scared um, of you guys or did they accept you into their um, group? Yeah, I accepted as an even more that I think a lot of them had probably never seen a human being before. So they've got no reason to be scared down there. Um, just to give you an idea of size, if I knelt down, one would look me in the eye. They're big, big birds. Um, and uh, we obviously had certain rules to stick to. We weren't allowed to approach super close there were a certain amount of meters we had to keep away but you'd set the camera up every day and you'd turn around and there'd be four penguins lying asleep next to you um <laughs> they absolutely loved our company and they were so inquisitive um so that yeah no that was lovely what uh, were there uh certain rules of engagement that you tried to follow um uh, you know other than the the, the getting too close. Did, were you ever in a situation where uh, maybe you you sensed harm um, might come to these penguins, and you had the ability to intervene uh, in some way? Did, did that ever come up? And if so, um, how do you make those decisions about where you know what you should just allow to happen naturally that would have happened whether you would have been there or not? Or you know, do you intervene and and maybe alter the way? these penguins behave yeah no we had a we had a big event which ended up being quite a big part of the film in the end um in september we'd been with the birds uh well we've been in antarctica what eight or nine months at this point so we were very close to the, the colony as a whole we'd been through almost everything that the, the birds had been through the storms um yeah just everything so we were we were close to the birds and yeah we returned after a two-week long storm and a load of birds had been blown into deep ravines um, and this was a unique situation because they at this time of the year in antarctica there are no no other there is no other life the emperors are the only ones to stay and breed through the winter and it's part of their strategy they do this because all their predators leave so they have no predators there um, when they give birth to their chicks or the chicks hatch and whatever um, however the the weather is probably their big predator and in this in this uh, occasion yeah, the weather had blown them into this ravine. And um, what we quickly worked out was the birds that still had chicks on their feet couldn't use their, their legs to their full range uh, and climb up these steep walls of ice. So they're having to make a horrendous decision to leave their chicks at the bottom to die and save themselves, or they, they both perished down there. Um, and we saw this on a, a couple of occasions, and it was simply something we, we couldn't walk away from knowing we'd not done anything. So So, yeah, we dug them a shallow ramp and... Fortunately, they they used it and saved themselves, so that was quite a nice feeling. That's incredible. Um, what was uh, was there ever a day where um, you know it looked like uh, you know a tragedy was going to strike? And uh, what was kind of one of your most harrowing days? Um, well, I think that the the emperors are so well built for that place. Um, they've evolved to withstand the most horrendous weather. Um, obviously, we haven't, but I was desperate to see them in action, see them battling against this weather. And um, they, I mean, they probably weren't in danger because what we could film in was only half of what they really have to put up with. So 
um, it's just it just becomes too unsafe for humans to be out on the ice with them. Um, visibility becomes zero. The wind speed you can't even stand up, um, uh, and obviously the temperature drops ridiculously. So, so yeah, what we filmed in was probably the worst we could cope with, but that was only half of what the birds really put up with. And yeah, we had a we had a really bad storm one day, and we stayed with the birds and filmed as much as we possibly could. Probably stayed a bit longer than we should have done because we still had to get back to our station while this weather deteriorated. And a um, a 10 minute skidoo journey took us just under three hours. Um, and we were simply relying on these tiny little GPSs, these little metal boxes on our handlebars. Um, our life was in their hands and, and they directed us back to the station because you, you you couldn't see the skidoo in front of you, even though you were tail to tail. Um, it was, yeah, horrendous. And that that was quite frightening if I'm honest, because you sort of know so many safety measures are in place that you'll be OK, but it doesn't make it any easier when you're in those conditions. And um, you've got goggles on that are filling with snow. You've got ice blasting across your face, frostbite on your face, and um, you're, you're leaning against the wind just to try and stay upright. And um, at the same time, trying to find the station and get back inside and warm up. So, yeah, that was quite a frightening day. And and we're we're getting to talk about this because when you got home, um, you started taking your experiences and you know uh, recording those thoughts and putting them together, and that eventually led us to your book, My Penguin Year: uh, Life Among the Emperors. Uh, what was the what was the motivation to record uh, your experiences and and make a book out of it? Well, I I was well aware of how lucky I was being given this opportunity, and I know. Um, that a lot of people would love to see an emperor penguin. I know a lot of people would love to get to Antarctica, but it's just, it's so remote. It's so expensive. Um, there's only certain times of the year you can actually get there. Uh, and I fully accept, even without this trip, I probably would have never got there. So I just thought this was the perfect opportunity to try and tell people what it what it's like down there and how amazing a place it is and that we do still have these places left. Um, you know, we're in a, we're in a, bit of a tough time with climate change and global warming um but there are still places out there which are worth protecting and um yeah antarctica is one of them what was uh lindsay when when you got back home and you you have a wife waiting for you you have a brand new son whom you've never met before waiting for you um i, I can only imagine the attachment that you felt uh to antarctica and to the the penguins and this whole experience um, you can't live there for the better part of a year and not, you know, feel some uh, attachment and kinship almost to the place and to the, the wildlife and, and feeling like you've become a part of it. Um, but then, of course, you have this strong pull and, and draw back home where you're from and with the people that love you. And um, that had to be a, a, a melancholy uh, sort of. Uh, leaving there and then the re-entry back home what what was that experience like for you um well yeah it was it was strange i'd i'd read some horror stories of people returning from isolation like i'd experienced um obviously i'd only lived with 11 other people for eight months i'd not seen anybody else i'd not seen a car i'd not seen a tree um yeah, life was very different down there and, and easy in some respects. Money doesn't exist. Time doesn't exist. Um, there are no borders. Um, so if, if you need help in the, in the summer, especially, you know, another station will probably come and help you. And they're usually from a, a different nation. So it, it's, um, yeah, it's a pretty amazing place. But obviously coming back, I was I was being thrown within hours back into reality and um, the hustle and bustle of, of of normal life, but I think I was I was saved by my little boy Walter because I was thrown back into parenthood um, and given a job to do, which uh, kept me distracted and um, I wasn't given much chance to think about my the the life I'd led for the previous year. Um, and I think without Walter, yeah, I'd have probably uh, I'd have struggled because I I, I definitely missed Antarctica and. Um, yeah, so yeah, so I've got him to thank for for keeping me busy. When uh how long did it take you to kind of gather all of your thoughts and find a narrative thread uh for this story? Um probably a year after I got back, um I'd 
uh, I'd actually started writing down there. I thought uh, I, if I can keep up, maybe by the end of the trip, I, I'll have a book. But um, it simply just took too much time and I couldn't keep up. Um, so, yeah, come February, I had to just put it to one side. But then, yeah, a year after I got back, um, I had a bit of time and I thought, you know, I'll give this a go. And um, and yeah, very quickly um, it started to take shape. And um, yeah, it's funny, really, because it's it's a you sit down and you just you write and you write and you write and you don't really know what you've got until you finish it and then go back through it. Um, so, yeah, but it, yeah, it was a process I enjoyed and it was such an incredible year. All my memories were still so vivid in my mind and obviously I had a film that we'd made that I could refer back to and remind me of a lot of those moments so um yeah did, did you ever worry um while you're there in Antarctica because the the hustle and bustle of life are absent there and you're fully present fully invested <laughs> in this uh um in 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 this trip and and you know being in this other place that that the days start running together and it's difficult to start, uh, you know, setting um, markers, if you will, uh, you know, for for days and weeks and months. You know, as you're as you're going back over these experiences and memories, is it is it difficult to pull out, you know, when things happened and what the progression of time actually was? Um. Um, not, maybe no, not, not really. Um, what I did was tried to split it up, obviously chronologically, um, and around the, <clears throat> the emperor's life cycle. So the first was obviously the birds returning, um, from their summer out at sea feeding, and then that would lead on to the courtship process. And then, uh, and then, yeah, just weaving my personal life and what I was experiencing throughout that period into, into those chapters. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I remember the whole thing so vividly that, um, uh, that, yeah, I, I sort of know exactly when things happened and that definitely made life easier when I started putting pen to paper and, and writing the book. Sure. Uh, the book is also, um, you know, filled throughout with these wonderful photos that you've included. Um, what was what was one of your favorite photos that you got from this experience? Oh, blimey. I don't. <clears throat> well, usually I don't really get a chance to take any photographs because my job is to film the wildlife. Um, but obviously this year was this trip was a bit different because we had such huge amounts of time. Um, my favorite photograph. Um, oh, blimey. Um, I don't know. Maybe that maybe. Well, maybe the the one on the cover, if I'm honest, those days, it's funny that the days that are crystal clear and you've got blue skies and a bright sun um, and white ice and then the birds and uh, those look, those days are beautiful. But it was actually the overcast days, like the one on the, the cover of the book, where everything was white um, and the birds just stood out so vividly against that. Um uh, yeah, so though those it's funny those overcast days, even though they weren't um, as pretty in pictures, they made um, they made for interesting shots. And yeah, yeah, well, probably the one on the cover. This this year, where you followed the the life cycle of the penguins, and you know watched the uh, you know through the mating season, and then the 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 hatching, and you know the um, uh, the little ones, and and how they're cared for. Um, you leave that and go home to immediately be a new father. Uh, was the um, I, I, I'm I'm betting that the irony there was not lost on you. No. Um, yeah, it was it was strange. I'd not I'd not thought about this beforehand. But how how um, how parallel my life was to an to an emperor's. I'd left I'd left Becky pregnant with. Um, with our first boy and just four months to go until he was born. And then obviously while I was in Antarctica, I watched the female emperors leave the males and um, leave them for, for 60 odd days, not knowing whether they'd return to a chick or not. So <clears throat> yeah, it was strange. And obviously it was our first, I mean, one of the reasons we decided to do this and make our trip so complicated was because we'd never, we, it was our first child. We didn't know what we were expecting. We didn't know what to expect. 
So we decided to go through this first uh, parenthood experience and, and see what happened. And I think had I known what I'd be missing, it would have been a different story. Well, what a fantastic story it is. Uh, my Penguin Year Life Among the Emperors. Lindsay, this is such a fascinating book. I learned so much that I didn't know uh, about uh, the area and uh, about the, the wildlife there. But, um, you know, I also felt a, a certain kinship with you as I'm reading it that uh, that I felt like I was going on this adventure with you. Um I, I love the book. It's out available everywhere now. We're going to put uh, links to it in the show notes. Um, there's also an audio book, and uh, did you narrate the audio book? Yes, I did, yeah. What a fantastic experience that must have been. Yeah. Um, yeah, very strange reading your own. It's the, very, it's the quickest I've ever read a book. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. We're going to put links to it in the show notes. Uh, Lindsay, uh, thank you so much for joining me today. If people are just learning about you, is there a place where they can connect with you online? Um, there is a, my actually my social media details are in the book, but it's um, it's from when I was a young boy, and it's uh, at badgerboy05, and that's uh, that's on all the social media uh, sites. Excellent. We're going to send everyone to see you, uh, Lindsay. Thank you so much for no, taking time to come you, on the show. You. No use crying over spilled milk. Eliza hated that cliche. She'd grown up a cliché, her life a bowl of cherries, duck soup, easy as pie, child's play behind a white picket fence. Mother had been the Wyatt Earp of clichés, firing them off, quick draw. A rotten apple spoils the barrel. Smile and the world smiles with you. Every dog has his day. Children should be seen and not heard. She believed them all, particularly this last. Eliza obliged, preferring to wander the streets of Wytheville, Virginia, on her own lonesome terms. The divorce left Laura a spinster librarian, and one false step on icy stairs left her an invalid as well. The accident happened on New Year's Eve, 1950. Laura had just locked the doors of Wytheville Public Library. We must make black-eyed peas tomorrow, Laura had been thinking, with turnip greens. That ensured a lucky new year, and if you swept some money over your threshold, a prosperous one, too. She loved those old southern traditions. She looked both ways, checking for negroes, but turned to heel on the icy marble of the stairs and fell into the bushes below, breaking the long bones in both legs. Eliza had taken advantage of her mother's absence. She'd lost her virginity that same night. She'd swept Ron Partridge over her threshold, initiating her own beloved tradition. She was nursing a hangover, giddily reliving the event, but around 8.30 she realized that her mother had not come down to breakfast. She checked her mother's bedroom, found it empty, took the bus down to the library, climbed the high stairs, knocked hard on the library doors, and heard a groan below. Laura lay under the William Penn barberry bushes, below the yellow-trimmed windows of the non-fiction section. Her white stockings ran Jezebel red with blood. Sweat and melted snow had soaked her blouse, and her gray forehead blazed. The broken bones didn't kill Laura Merrick. She lay in the hospital, wheezing, her legs mortared up in casts. She had few visitors after the first week. Her church group was glad to fret over a poor thing for a day or two, but they trickled away when Laura had the bad manners to linger. On Valentine's Day, as her mother slept, Eliza drew big, sloppy hearts on her casts. Laura harumphed when she woke and insisted on keeping her legs hidden beneath blankets afterwards. But in late March, something miraculous happened. Laura's self-control dropped. She ranted at nurses, spit at doctors, swore like a Navy pilot dropping F-bombs on Hiroshima. She had dementia, the doctors said. Eliza decided that her mother had just stopped believing her own bullshit. The spells continued over the next two weeks, and Eliza enjoyed her mother's company for the first time. They swapped bawdy jokes, ogled the handsome interns, and chattered like best girlfriends late into the evening. They had long conversations, and Laura spoke her own mind in her own words about things that mattered to her. It broke Eliza's heart when the prim, condescending librarian returned. Laura hardly acknowledged anything that had passed between them. The clichés returned. You can't have your cake and eat it, too. 
A leopard doesn't change its spots. Nothing is certain except death and taxes. This last proved true. On April 15th, Laura Merrick marked her Bible with a tongue depressor, set it on her nightstand, leaned back against the headboard, and coughed blood down the front of her nightdress. Eliza found her that way, dead as the proverbial doornail, and yes, the blood was thicker than water, just as her mother had always said. Much thicker than water, in fact, perhaps as thick as molasses in January. <laughs> 